just start kicking things off because it's I we haven't like mastered this part of our conversations yet. I I keep saying we need to like play music or um, get a vibe going. I've got to get this down. I've got to get like the music piece down because I think it would just like open up a whole new world for us here. Um, but I am the minute that I met Ko, who I will be interviewing today. I was just blown away and couldn't be more excited for this day to come. Um, we were just joking around that I, I didn't realize that today was even the day because it's nor we normally have these conversations on Thursdays. It's after the long weekend. I was like, oh my gosh, it's here. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce Ko Kalila Olukunola. Did it right? Um, today and can't wait for all of you to learn from her just as I have um, over the course of the last few weeks. And Ko, um, as she goes by, is there's someone at my door. This is such a this is such a moment um, that I try to prepare for, and it's happening right now. So sorry, someone's ringing my doorbell. Um, <clears throat> It'll be fine. Anyways, okay, I'm gonna introduce you because when we met, I think, you know, what stood out to me is just like how different your background is um, and the work that you're doing and the impact that it's having. So you are the chief people officer of True Colors, um, which is a brewery that offers second chances to formerly incarcerated people and active game members gang members. Um, you're a people first leader who invests in her employees personal and professional development. She's created this incredible community and events and onboarding tactics that we're all gonna learn from today that have supported this blended cultures, the blending of these different cultures and cultivating deep senses of belonging, right? Um, one of the things that you're gonna talk about today are some of the experiences that you have your employees go through during their onboarding, like jumping out of planes, creating reverse mentorship programs. Um, but you as an individual, I think when I met you, just the fact that you have stepped into a people leadership role and kind of become or emulated a lot of what many of us hope to achieve in terms of like, actually achieving belonging and creating these environments where people are able to bring their whole selves to work. Mm -hmm. What I'm hoping today for all of us um, through understanding um, the work that you've done is for us to, to think more deeply about, doesn't mean that all of us here are going to go out and necessarily be able to hire uh, formerly incarcerated or gang members into our employee populations. But what I do hope is that we can start understanding where we may be missing the mark in terms of our inclusive practices and our recruiting processes and how we're um, maybe overlooking talent that could really actually uh, create a lot of change um, and innovation within our organization. So. I'll stop talking there, but I just wanted to, to set up the conversation because uh, in the dialogue that I've had with you over the course of the last couple of weeks, it's really opened my eyes to, um, you know, when, when we're brave and when we do things that in, in your case, that may seem like uh, going much further than we could have ever expected, the outcomes are also uh, always much more than we expected. So want to just welcome you here and ask you to add anything there that I missed about you and your background. Um, I think you nailed it. Um, I think you nailed it. Um, you know, uh, True Colors is an exciting mission. I will say that it's not for everyone, but everyone does have a portion of what a company like True Colors needs. Um, but we often don't know that it exists. So we have to pull that piece out of us. And we get to that piece by discovering who we are as people first leaders and understanding what it means for us to belong, therefore being able to create processes and systems for our people to belong. So, That's right. Yeah. Would you share with um, everyone here, like? the journey that got you to becoming the chief people officer of true colors 
Yeah, so um, very untraditional, right? Um, I just, I, I did event and set design. So before I began building people, I built things. And um, I had this moment in my life, I wanna call it a midlife crisis, but I, I haven't hit midlife yet. And um, I closed this event and set design business um, after loving the job, but I just had this thing on the inside of me that said that I, I needed to do something more. And um, I started, uh, empowering women who were in business using Dr. Seuss books, uh, lessons of leadership for powerful women who aspire to, to lead. What easier way to inspire both novice and seasoned women and bring them together than with the Dr. Seuss book, right? And so a book like the Lorax who speaks for the trees, how did you help women find their voice who don't have a voice? And so um, on that journey of empowering women first, um, it led me to New York City. I was speaking on a platform at the Women's Venture Fund. And uh, it was mostly for women who had started businesses and had a first or second round of seed investment. And the founder of True Colors was actually there as an investor, given a perspective on when to cultivate a company or, or when to kill a company, even though you're passionately in love with it. And I introduced myself to him. Someone had tried to connect us, but by email, never, never saw him in person. But when somebody sends you an email, of course, you Google them, right? And so I knew what he looked like and um, I introduced myself in person. And he did the huh. I did the huh. And we ended up grabbing dinner after the conference. And he began to tell me this wild and crazy story about starting the brewery that hired active gang members. First of all, I thought he had lost his mind, Sarah, because I mean, who intentionally jumps into an industry that they are not familiar with, they didn't grow up in, and they've been a, a serial entrepreneur in the tech space all their lives. Um, and he decided it because uh, not too far from an office that he had for a company he owned at the time called Untapped, uh, a 16 year old was gunned down uh, by another uh, 16 and 17 year old and he was appalled. He reached out to the district attorney and reached out to the friends in the police department and he wanted to learn more about gangs. And so he began to start this journey at that point. And I ran into him in the middle of him starting this journey. And, you know, when he was telling me this story, I remember growing up in Brooklyn, New York and being surrounded by gangs and understanding the street life, even understanding the language. And uh, for a long time, and I think for a lot of us, like, um, Empathy has always been something that we've been talking about for the past couple of years or something that's there. But there's also a part of our story that as people officers, we don't share because there are boundary lines. We always say, keep your work at work keep what's happening at home at home. But in this moment that I was talking to George Taylor, I realized that a part of my home life was um, was required to share with him so that he realized that you can take someone who had faced challenges and give them education and opportunity and they would be able to succeed. And so I shared my story. I shared a story about a 13 year old who grew up in the streets of Brooklyn and who faced some challenges. And in those challenges, she found herself um, thinking that life was over, but with education, with opportunity, uh, she was able to succeed. I said, you know, this, I gave it to him in third party now. I was like, you know, she 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 started the business, she, she sold the business and, you know, now she's just empowering women. And he was like, I need to get this girl to speak to the guys. I was like, well, I'm the girl. And he looked at me and he was like, you know, I didn't look like what I had just shared. And it was at that point where he invited me to come in for one day to speak to the guys and tell them the story. And the story wasn't to stop the violence, put the guns down, uh, change your life. The story was a story of me putting myself in front of them as exhibit A, as a leader who had went through a transformational change herself internally, and then externally, you wouldn't be able to see what she had went through and she was here today. And that for them was empowering. Um, they told him that he they that they enjoyed the conversation and he invited me back for a week. And then after a week, he gave me a 40 day contract. And that was the beginning of what we call Disrupt You, which is our onboarding. We'll talk about a little later. And then from that 40 day contract, he renewed my contract for two years. That man made me wait for two years before he offered me a job. I don't know if I really wanted one though, right? Because I had been freelancing for so long and you know, submitting to authority after being on your own for so long is has its own challenges. So I had to grow in that space on my own. But after two years, he said, hey, look, I have this really important position in education and in people, and you've been doing it. And I think you're the one. And in my mind, Sarah, I thought HR leaders are boring. 
They typically wear glasses. I do have glasses, right? And, <laughs> and they're quiet. And here I was, I was loud, extremely extroverted. Um, I can sometimes say I'm dirty HR and the dirty is not meaning I break the rules. I come close to the edge though. And I love people. And so I got into HR by accident, but I believe because I didn't go through a traditional door, um, because I didn't go in the way most people went in, I was able to create and, and shape in a space where I looked at the people first and not the processes and the policies instead. Now do y'all see why I wanted Ko to come on and talk? Um, everything that you just said, first of all, it like touches my heart. It makes me emotional, honestly, like listening to you describe that experience that you had. Um, and when you and I first met, you were talking about, I think you called it like underestimated talent, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that you considered yourself, you know, like stepping into this role. I don't, I don't know if we would call you, un, if, if anyone underestimated you after meeting you, but have you yourself been, a, you know, a recipient of that feeling of being underestimated? Absolutely. Underestimated, underestimated, um, undervalued um, at points. You felt undereducated, not just as someone who had a, a, a background, right, where she had to check a box, you know, but also someone who was a minority, you know, and a woman in the spaces. And so I always felt like I had to do more, but I always thought that they saw my background and not what I had built since then. And so, um, I had to, I had to fight, you know, I had to press, I had to always prove a track record or prove myself, I felt like, but if someone didn't take a chance on me, I wouldn't be here today talking to you guys on Bravely. And so I like to show up and tell people that when you are hiring star performers or looking for a star performer, you may not be able to find one, but if you find someone who has soft skills that you can help cultivate and you can teach them technical skills, you'll find your star performer. They'll be dedicated, they'll be loyal, and they have things like like resilience and grit, you know, that you can't learn that, that, that you can't learn just in a classroom It's learned by experience. And in that experience, you know, it helps shape who you are. And so I've been a recipient of these opportunities. I've been a recipient of changing what I believe, not just about myself, but about other people, because I know what I experienced. And so my perspective is different. I go into the situation thinking, you know, me being on the opposite side of the desk, because I was there before. And so understanding that I understand that my language has to change I understand how I lead has to change and I understand that when I'm speaking to people is going to be on multi levels and multi languages I have to speak their talk because they may not understand the technical jargon that we use in the HR space I can use it but listen y'all I can code switch real well and I think that that's what makes me unique is that I understand both perspectives but I also know how to build the bridge to bring those perspectives together to shape a workforce that is impactful informed and um, empowered. I want to come back later to what you just shared around code switching, because I'm really interested in your perspective on that. But I want to hear from you or have you share with everyone um, what you've built at True Colors in terms of the onboarding and and the uniqueness of it, because you really are like marrying different communities of people and you're doing it on purpose. So can you take us through um, what it looks like to start at True Colors in many different roles. Yeah, so great. So our onboarding is unique. Most of us have one day onboarding, right? Or maybe maybe two days out onboarding. So it starts with eight weeks. And that's eight weeks where we teach you life skills, social skills, business skills, and beer. Let me go back and talk about how we bring people in and recruiting first. Also, yeah, you know, please. before before uh, a team member has a one on one with a department man manager, I open up a group format. And so we have an open house. And in that open house, you're hearing the true color story, you're hearing our why you're seeing where you could fit in in the different departments that we have and we have a conference room crawl where i put each department in the conference room and you can stop in the conference room to talk to other team members who work in that department and meet the department leader i usually add um a mocktail because we used to do this thing here called mocktail mondays and it was my way of transitioning the team from drinking soda it was me trying to be sneaky you know transitioning them from drinking soda because in this we work on your health also and drinking juice or some kind of carbonated water but we have that department 
St. Paul. And then once you have that experience, you get a form where you check your top three choices of the departments you're interested in. Because a lot of our guys that are active gang affiliates don't have experience working in these departments. They're based on where they want to go based on that one day experience or what they heard. Um, and so when they check those three the uh, apartments that they're interested in, it's that sheet that I use to begin to schedule interviews, you know, with the department managers. So before you have a one on one, you have a free for all with everyone. And so we want you to feel welcome, you know, a part of the community. And when you feel welcome and a part of the community, it makes it easier for you to have a one on one because it's with someone you already sparked the conversation with. And um, after that one on one, um, the team is chosen, we usually do 12 classes at a time It's the ratio that we found that worked. And in that classroom is, you know, you're partnered with people that were considered rivals or you may have had challenges with. And so the goal is to rid you of limiting belief and to find a way to unify. And so we do that with disrupt you, disrupting what you believe about yourself, disrupting what you believe about your future and disrupting your perspective of the individual sitting next to you. And that's eight weeks of life skills, social skills, business skills, and beer. And that first week is always belief week where we're teaching you again to believe again, because early on, I tried to just layer on skills. And if you teach just skills without teaching belief, then individuals with no experience will find it hard because they don't have the confidence they need to apply those skills. And so when you add belief and you help them find the confidence that they can and you give them the skills, then they will. And the powerful part is that they don't do it alone. They do it in a group among people that have become peers. So we can fail forward and fail fast as a family, right, together. And it helps them continue to go. A lot of times we teach people things, but we never give them experience to use it until they actually in the position and sometimes a tough spot. And so I like to use that inside of Disrupt You. Um, the framework for that uh, eight week onboarding is formal classroom training while I'm in front of a classroom similar to what you see behind me, a development activity. I want you to research what you heard, a special project. Now you get to present what you heard in your own voice, which appears, and then a beyond the block experience. I take you outside the building to give you an experience where you can apply. And after that eight weeks and that last week of experience you learning, we go skydive because what better way to bring people together than to put them in a, a, a situation where they have to believe that they're going to go up and come back down together. So most of our team members have never been in an airplane. And so they're the first ones probably that can say that they went up but never landed. Right. That was a little joke I threw in y'all. And, and so they go, well, we go and we skydive and skydive is my way of initiating the team. And once they skydive and they hit the ground, um, their salary goes up. So everybody starts, you know, with a livable wage at 30K. Um, after they go through that eight week onboarding and skydive, they go up to 35K and they get full benefits, medical, dental, vision. They also get access to stock options inside the company. And then they begin a 90 day internal internship in the department that they express interest in, getting over learning curves, stretch assignments and building cohesion with the team. And after that 90 days, they flow into their associate role with another pay increase and begin their career journey. We have some sustainable tools in place to continue to cultivate what they learn and to help our team members stay on track. Um, but that's the onboarding. And I don't think that Disrupt You is just solely for gang members. I think disruption needs to happen in all of us, especially at a time where we're looking to build more diverse, equitable, and inclusive spaces and communities of belonging. What better way than to shake ourselves to disrupt what I believe about my peer, about their upbringing, their education, or their economic status. Yes. I mean, everything that you just said, like thinking about like bringing people into an environment where from the minute they arrive, you are cultivating that sense of belonging so that when they ultimately get to a place where they are interviewing, they already have that comfort level. They're feeling included. You've normalized the space to give them a, more of an opportunity to succeed in the, right. in the next step of the process, which is just, you know, a no brainer. And I, yeah, and I look at these soft skills that they're good at. You know, they're really resilient. They understand leadership. They are committed to their team. So there's a level of loyalty there. And so it gives me a hard truth about soft skills, the importance mm -hmm. of them in the workplace. You know, we talked before uh, um, this a couple of weeks ago, a lot of organizations hire people that are really good at what they do, but they don't have the emotional intelligence to get the job done because we pay attention to their briefcase and not their hard case or their head case, their motivating factors and their cognitive ability 
ability to face challenges in the role that they're in. I can hire somebody that can crunch numbers, but if sales are down, we need to create a strategy real quick and somebody to hold the team together. I need somebody who understands how to uh, authentically adapt, you know, in that kind of environment. And a lot of people that can just crunch numbers aren't the ones. It's usually someone who understands how to face challenges. Yeah, absolutely. How does this also like, can you all imagine getting hired? I mean, I'm sure you <laughs> have time, but um, in order to get your next pay increase, you're going to have to jump out of a plane. Um, I don't know how well I would do in that situation. But again, like, I think what really struck me when you and I met was just like, think exactly what you just said is this like thinking outside of the box and you know, like many of us may not be able to do what you were doing, but it's really about challenging ourselves to think differently, mm -hmm. even around like how we invite people to interview, right? Because that person might be bringing a, a negative experience into, you know, past negative experience into an interview and anything we can do to help facilitate, even if they don't end up getting the job. That's right. Um, a positive outcome for them is worth it every step of the way, right? Yeah, agree completely. I think that experience can change what somebody believes about the world of work, right? Yes. I mean, it's powerful. How, talk to us a little bit about, because I'm assuming not everyone that works at True Colors um, is a second chance hire. So how are you integrating these two profiles of employees and, and how do you create that that culture where they can come together and work side by side? Yeah, great question, um, Sarah. So um, everyone's not gang, everyone's not a second chance hire. We have uh, people with a little bit more experience in the workforce, uh, people who actually have no experience with the inner city or people that may have been stereotyped as marginalized. And so blending those two communities is a different kind of inclusivity, you know? Um, and so for me, it is part of those sustainability tools. So when I create culture events on our calendar, I do it with the intention to unify people, not just unify gang, but also unify people who may not understand the individuals that they work with. And you have to be extremely intentional about it. So things like our third Thursday community gathering is a way for the community to gather and to do a project together, to break bread together, and to spark conversation. So I remember I actually created conversation cards because I was so concerned that people were going to ask the wrong thing because you know people sometimes in their mouths they can get in trouble. And so and, and sometimes people are afraid to ask questions because they just don't know if they're asking it right because again people's history may include some kind of trauma and you don't want to trigger it. And so I created a series of questions that were you know on the, the line and put them inside a conference room and assign people to conference rooms. And and they sparked conversations. And what you realize is that people have more in common than they do that separates them. What you realize is that some of the, the team members that um, never been to the inner city know people that grew up with some of the gang. And so um, those third Thursday community gatherings is important as opposed to us having an all hands meeting. I have a, a happy hour instead. And so before we start talking business, we socialize um, with conversation um, and find out what's happening in our week and get to know each other. And most recently, our This What You program, I redesigned it to make it fast track disruption. And so it's a half day where I blend both gang and non-gang together that are new hires and let them take the, the course, the, the, the shorter version of our onboarding at one time and hold them responsible to create a disrupt you formula, but to also spark a conversation there. I have a young man that just started to run our pub who is not gang and the young man that just started is on for, in our community street team who is gang. And they always tell me when I see them that they feel so connected because they went through that experience together. And so mm -hmm. it starts with the, the events that you shape, those moments that you empower, you know, and um, how you listen to your people. So it, it, it's all the cultural events, it's all the intentionality and in shaping things that's happening internally in the workplace. And I'll add, I'll leave with, I'll finish with this. Um, for another organization that I was helping try to build some kind of inclusion, they were beginning to bring in some second chance hires. I created an inclusorship, which is a re really weird name, right? And it was just um, similar to our third Thursday community gathering, but it was coffee or lunch. And it was bringing people together from different 
departmental levels, different educational levels, um, different cult cultures. And the metrics for it was what we call perspective points. Three questions. Did you learn something new? Did you find something you had in common? Would you do it again? And you were able to repeat in that circle by having a inclusive ship lunch or coffee on the company with someone else. And so if companies are more intentional with bringing people together, we would see remarkable change that would begin to unfold in productivity and engagement and with conversation that you see happening. Yes. Can <laughs> you, one of the other things um, that like stuck out to me when we spoke was the innovation and the performance that you saw within these second chance hires is, is what I'll keep referring to them as. Um, and I, I think like the lesson for me in that was just that there are people that are even qualified for jobs that if they don't have like that one thing or, you know, they, they might be lacking one or two things that we're looking for, but they still have like great experience you know, we may not end up hiring them. And I think there's a huge lesson in this that, you know, sometimes we have to just go with our gut or, or yep. see through or, or give people the opportunity to grow into roles or develop skills if they met, if they have three out of the five. And sometimes we do a better job of that at Bravely um, that I'm even describing. But I think we all, those of us, I used to work in HR and talent acquisition for years. And I think we all know someone that maybe transferred to a role and ended up performing unbelievably well and had no experience prior to moving over. And we tend to not allow ourselves to open up to that potential or possibility when we're hiring outside of the organization. So I'd love to just hear anecdotally a few examples of, of how these hires have like out like performed outsized what your expectations were um because i do think again it's it's just a powerful message for all of us yeah um so i'll give, give you like, yeah tons of examples a couple that i like to always share uh guys that came in early on um, when we really didn't know what we were doing because there's no blueprint for this. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember a young man coming in after serving um, uh, three years in the feds. Uh, he took one of our classes and disrupt you and was really interested in marketing, but social media, media marketing. He thought this is what I want to do. And so uh, we began to uh, give him the coursework that he needed to educate himself and to learn. Um, his goal was to eventually excel in that department today. You know, he is assistant director of marketing, social media. So what you see online um, is his SEO strategy that he put together on his own. Um, he just got pre-approved for his first mortgage. So he's buying a house. Um, uh, he's in his daughter's life and he's mentoring some of the younger people in the community, you know, and this was someone that didn't have any experience in the field that if you saw the resume, you wouldn't hire him because it didn't match what you were looking for. Um, but you had someone that was a quick learner, someone who knew how to authentically adapt into a stressful startup environment and who had a desire and a passion to learn. And so we gave him opportunity and he's ran with it. Another young man uh, came in working with us. He thought that beer was prepackaged and made in the can. It wasn't brewed, right? Funny. And he began to uh, study beer on his own and realized that he wanted to he wanted to be, be, be part of the brewing process. So he went and not only worked for us, but he went and volunteered at the local brewery and asked them, could he work there for free so that he could learn how to brew beer because we didn't have equipment at the time. Our beer just went to market last year. And so he spent a year there learning, um, cleaning floors and kegs because a big part of the brewing process is sanitation. So he humbled himself and put himself in a situation where he could learn, he sacrificed his time, you know, um, but he sacrificed his time for teaching. And today, that young man, I went with him a couple of months ago uh, to buy an engagement ring because he's the first one in his family in a long time to pop a question, you know, uh, so he, he's engaged now and he's one of our lead brewers. So when people drink True Light, it's because uh, one of our, um, our team members made it. it was, it's because Press made it. And he's not only our lead brewer, but he's a level three Cicerone now today. So he's continuing to educate himself and learn. And so when we look at 
some of the individuals like them, or we can look at Blanc, who is our outside sales manager. He manages the team that's outside, that's responsible for our big box retailers, our beer and stores, those samplings and talking to customers. You know, this is what is considered our second chance hire. He runs this department on his own. And it's because we provided the, ed the education, the opportunity, and they ran with it, right? Mm -hmm. They had a yes. and when we begin to hire and recruit people for a long time, we've always recruited people just on hard skills. But I remember reading um, a report where data says 96% of the companies says that their businesses would not be successful without individuals with specific soft skills. And so if we begin to talent optimize a little bit better, and we're not just looking at what someone can do, but we look at who they are and the environments they're able to handle, their level of empathy, their adaptability quotient, right? When you have to face a trying situation and we need you to have emotional intelligence, we don't need anybody who's gonna get upset with customers, but nobody who somebody who understands how to pace their conversation conversation and listen to what the customer is saying, then we would begin to hire more strategically. And I think that in, 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 in the time that we're in right now with the great resignation, that the, 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 the real statement is the great revelation is that there still are a group of people out here that we haven't looked at because we've stereotyped them as second chance hires or something else, but they have the skills that we need to help cultivate a powerful workforce and to come in and to become star performers to take us to the next level. I don't know SEO and strategy for social media, but Spree does. And I can go to him and ask those questions because he got an opportunity and he continuously educated educated himself. And so the power in this whole conversation for me, Sarah, is that when I look at these young men, um, I look at and I see myself. And if we don't begin to give individual chances, I think we'll miss out on what we need in this new world of work. Amen to that. <laughs> um, you really are like, you're, you're making me emotional just talking this way, because I think you know, what you're, what, what this comes down to. And again, like I want you and I, I've said this to you a hundred times, like we're not here advocating that everyone go out and hire gang members. No. Um, but what we're trying to, to really get to the heart of is that, you know, bias exists in all of us. And I think it rears its ugly head most when we're interviewing people that are different, that, mm -hmm. you know, either come from an underrepresented group or, um, you know, just don't have the background that we are used to seeing. And we just immediately eliminate them from any potential role or opportunity that we have. Um, and I'd be interested in hearing like, you know, as you've worked even with other companies, because I know you continue to consult with people on this, like, how are you, you know, how do you help drive towards like, is it because we've all been through bias training like there's got to be other ways for us to really start drilling into uncovering talent that we otherwise might overlook um without just putting everyone through an unconscious bias training yeah yeah another great question and so definitely they, they may, there's probably in no companies here that would that are looking to hire gang members, right? But we all hire people, and that's you never know. After today, we might we might all be open right? to you. Know, you might we come in people, and so when working with other companies, I always go in and I have a, a a wow assessment. I like to call it, and a wow assessment is like a world of work assessment. It's a scorecard, right? And so you can look at the scorecard to see the health of your organization, not just looking at things like your financial data or your customer perspective but your internal customer perspective, what are your people saying, you know, um, what, what are your DEI scores, how's your recruitment, you know, what's your pay scale look like, uh, according to cultures, and so I'll do a quick wow assessment, if you want to go deeper, it requires an audit, you know, you can't create a solution for a problem unless you begin to audit what's happening inside the workplace, and once you audit, you analyze, assess, you address, and then you activate the stakeholders that's going to be responsible for uh, putting this work in. And it's with everyone. It's with um, HR, who's responsible for talent and recruiting, but it's also the hiring manager, right? Because sometimes they have the last say, we can bring them in, but it's up to the hiring manager. And so I just don't think that 
Implicit bias training, DEI training, belonging training is a one-time thing. I think it is something that has to be ongoing and that companies need to continuously assess themselves to hold themselves accountable to the metrics that work best for them. So mm -hmm. not all organizations want to hire 50% minorities that work in this area and they want 30% to be women. Like everybody has a different goal. So whatever your goal is, you create your goal and we help create the strategy on how you need to get there because the, the vehicles for everyone is different. For some people, it's going to come out in their recruitment. For others, it's going to be in their recognition and reward system for others it just means they need a boost to culture because it's on life support right now you know and i told you guys this i definitely don't get everything that i want here in the company i work for my ceo says no to me most of the time i always come out swinging but as long as i swing that's what makes the difference for me it's like if, if i stop swinging then i need to get away from the table Right. I don't need to I, if I don't use my voice at the table, then I need to get up from the table. If I'm not going to fight, then I should resign from my position. Then I can't call myself a people officer because a people officer is focused on people. And so um, when working with other companies, let's do an assessment, a wow assessment, a world of work assessment. Are you um, are you uh, barely thriving? Are you successful? Are you prospering? Right? What, what, where are you? You know? And then if you want to go deeper, let's do an audit. You know, like go to your senior level staff and tell them, like, hey, I want to check the wealth of the organization because I think that it's more that we can do to help cultivate our people, especially with the great resignation. Let's look at our training and development. Like, let's make it ongoing. If people can't go up in your organization, you have to find a way so that they can stretch wide. Their capacity can be increased so there's more to do because people always think that growth is upward, but growth. Growth can be wide. Also, if you give me more responsibility at work, then I may continue to stay because some people just want to do more and they don't feel recognized. They don't feel like they belong. And we won't be able to measure that unless we put our ear to the ground, unless we actively listen, or as I told you guys, unless we activate the kind code that knowledge inspires new direction. Yeah. I feel like I just want to like do this. Um, I'm reading everything that, that um, people saying in, in the chat um and you know everything around like DIB really does need to be infused into everything and um you know when you ignore amy said when you ignore certain groups of people you can truly miss out on diverse experiences and ideas and innovation honestly um when you think about marketing alone you know half the time the people that are creating the campaigns or they they don't identify with who the buyer is as an example um and that continues to just be something that that has to be elevated and i think what is often difficult is that these conversations this work the swinging so to speak it's not easy it takes a lot of energy and it takes you know one of the things in particular around conversations related to hiring diversity or making sure that once they're hired that there's opportunity that that there's a place for them to feel included um you know these conversations they're not one and done and they're never easier at least in my experience it's something that i've had to like really wrap my brain around and because i'm so committed to it i'm just i have to keep telling myself this, the way that you feel right now, this uncomfortable feeling, you're, you're going to have it again, keep going. Um, like, do you think there needs to be more of this? Cause I'm imagining, like you said, you get told no a lot, even by your own CEO, that this is not easy what you're doing, that this is not, um, that there's a ton of challenges associated with it. And for everyone on this call, I know that a lot of us aspire or want to create cultures that sometimes feel like are not achievable because we don't hold all of the power or the can't influence on the level that we want to. So what would you say to, to those of us who are standing shoulder to shoulder with you really want to create this change um, and start eliminating this bias so we can hire more diverse talent? How do we, how do we keep swinging? What is it that yeah, great question. So I think that first we have to build the case, right? 
we have to build a case to present and the build, building the case often starts where companies pay the most attention and it's their bottom line, their profit margin. And so we have to show the return on investment for this kind of training and input in our internal communities in our com company. We have to show what happens if we include this training, if we add this event for our culture, if we infuse our environment with these different strategies. And there's always a return on investment for your product or services, but there also is a return on investment for your people. It reduces turnover, it reduces burnout, it increases engagement, which therefore increases productivity. And so um, I would tell HR people that are listening, anyone that's listening to begin to build the case and you build a case with data. There's tons of data out there right now that shows what happens when you infuse environments with the right tactics. You may wanna put out a survey in your organization so that you can find out what's happening internally with your team. And you take that information, you create the solutions first and you present it to your senior team and you show them the data. It's, it's, it's almost like you are the lawyer and you are representing the team and you are in the court of company law and you are telling them why you need these pieces to this puzzle to be implemented. And it's okay if you don't get the whole entire system, but if you can begin to build a foundation of the system, if you can get a listening ear, that means that you can continuously present the case. You know, I always have to show the goal. You know, I always have to show the return on investment. We need to do this, you know, and this is why we need to do this. I want all hands to be happy hour. Why? Why would we do that? Because I need to connect people. And if I connect people, then they stay engaged. And if they stay engaged, then they stay empowered. If they stay empowered, then it'll help increase productivity. And is it perfect right now? Absolutely not. But there's been a shift and a change. My CEO just told me on Friday, he was like, it really feels good in here, KO. And I just was like, mm, yeah, okay, thank you. But it's those little moves on the needle. So I would tell you guys is listening to uh, build the case, you know, and build the case by pulling data. And that data is gonna come from a survey in your company along with the data that's already out there. But what happens when you infuse your organization with different strategies and tactics? Now we'll remember what worked for companies like GE or, and I'm just naming companies or Walmart or anybody else is not going to work for you. You have to address the individual needs for your people. And when it comes to that kind of training, um, uh, that implicit bias training and that DEI training or creating a community of belonging, you have to remind your CEO that uh, one, that is not just a one and done, it's a process that we may not find solutions for quickly, but that is ongoing. This is not a sprint, it's a marathon, so it will always continue. And as it continues, these are the metrics and check-ins that shows where we are and what we're doing. Again, I can't repeat enough, building the case, showing the journey of your internal customers and what those milestones are that you want to create and the change that you eventually want to see. So we may not have everything we need, but if I can have an event on third Thursday, I can implement the training on every second Monday. I can bring in coffee and donuts every first Monday. Those things begin to move you closer, little pieces of the time. And so we don't have to get everything we want, but we have to be willing to fight for something to get something so that we can begin to build the puzzle to the pieces that we've been assigned to carry and put together in the workplace. Yeah, I think sometimes we don't connect those dots. Like even when I think about internally at my own company, if something's presented to me as, you know, we want to just do like this one-off event, um, you know, you just connected the dots for me around the engagement, the, you know, plugging people in, the more they feel, obviously I know that ultimately that's our end goal, but like being reminded of, you know, we're trying to increase engagement by a certain percentage here based on our last survey and, and really laddering up what those things are. I mean, it sounds basic, but sometimes we forget that it's the little things that actually have the biggest impact. I forget, you know, I forget because sometimes you just want things fixed. You mm -hmm. want it done, you know, and, you know, I, I always have to remind myself that this is but one piece, you know, I'm, I've become really uh, good at using events and programs to drive outcomes that I know that the company needs to be successful. And the people strategy should always align with the business strategy. And we do that by having those conversations with our CEO and understanding what they need and creating a strategy based on how we get the people there. Of course, also addressing their needs.
Got it. Someone's asking a question. If anyone else has questions, feel free to throw them in the Q and A or even in the chat because I'm watching. Um, how do you mitigate the bias built into applicant tracking systems um, that eliminates candidates that may only have three of the five requirements? So I hate the ATS that eliminates candidates. You know, um, when that happens, um, I often want to look at those candidates that's been eliminated first. Right before I look at the people that's been brought in, um, I don't use a uh, applicant tracking system right now um, at all, and I choose not to do that because of that very reason. Because I missed out on employees and team members, I set my own pace and I look for skills that's transferable, you know. And so I'm not just looking at um, someone that uh, uh, let me see has good. Uh, customer service skills, I may look for words like interpersonnel skills or something else. And so I'm using my own applicant tracking system and it requires more sweat equity and time energy, y'all. I'm sorry, um, because there's not one that's been created unless somebody makes it that will eliminate candidates because of those requirements. If we can begin to set our own requirements and what we need, then it would make that better sense. But for now, um, whoever asked that question, I go through it on my own. I um, I look through resumes on my own and I search, which is really weird with Google find, right? Terrible. I'm looking for words that's in the resume that I can use that, that may be a synonym or can be translated into something else I'm looking for. And I pull those resumes and I pay attention to them. I, I can give you an example. I'm looking for a specific role right now. And I had a young lady who doesn't have um, any sales experience in the role um, is a sales role, but she was um, um, a specialist in the bank and she helped the bank increase closings by 75% while she was there. But because she wasn't in a sales role, that key word doesn't pop up on her resume. But what this told me is that she can communicate effectively. She can interact with people of a diverse background and she's a closer. And so I'm gonna bring her in for an interview. And so I have to, you often have to look at those things yourself, you know, um, and create your own system that you can use, which yes, requires more work. But somebody said new business idea. Maybe somebody up here wants to run with that or maybe Sarah's gonna run with that, right? <laughs> but we need an applicant track system where we can create our own requirements and our own rules inside of it so we won't exclude people but we can include everyone that may have a specific match to what we're looking for yeah transferable skills tracy that's right and you know tara saying she couldn't get a manager past a two-year break wouldn't i i would love to take a two-year break right now and then come back to the workforce and not <laughs> for it and so much is changed thankfully like when i started working you had to stay in a job for three to five years and it was just like a totally different world that we lived in i think there's some i think we've gained in some ways but we're still struggling to get to that place where we consider these people that just you and i were talking about this in our last convo how i came out of a a bias training bias training right before we met. And I was thinking about how I didn't want to see anybody's names when I looked at the resumes anymore. I didn't, the first call, I no longer want to see their faces that I'm just so acutely aware now of, I mean, even in my own world, I don't, I don't want to have video calls unless I'm in this room <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I know the background's better because I'm acutely aware of the fact that people will be sizing up every single moment or everything that they see, right? And so I do think that, um, you know, there's there's whole schools of thought on this, but um, the the elimination, the automatic elimination, I think is, is a big one that has to uh, be addressed. I agree. I wanted to answer, I think Naveen said something. Uh, she, Naveen said, I know you mentioned that not using an ATS system takes more sweat equity, but how many candidates is this sustainable for the time? Not many. 
I wanted to say mm -hmm. that, right? And so if you have an ATS system, maybe you can change your keywords and you can synonym them. You can look for transferable skills that you can use that may work for the role that you're actually hiring for. Don't just look for the hard skills as keywords, but look for the soft skills that may be required for the actual role based on where your company is and the atmosphere is. You know, like you just don't need an HR leader. You need an HR leader that's specific to your current needs. And so um, I would begin to relook at your crit critical keywords that you use. You know, um, when you uh, set your requirements in your ATS system, depending on what kind of ATS system you need. But you're right, it's not that sustainable. Um, you know, I'm not screening a thousand resumes, but I don't recommend anyone looking through keywords for a thousand resumes. Just go ahead and change your critical keywords and look for synonyms or skills that can transfer. Mm -hmm. I said earlier that I wanted to go back before this call is over, this conversation is over and talk about, you mentioned code switching. You sort of said it in a positive way here that you're like good at it. Um, but I think a lot of what, I think we all code switch to some degree, but I think uh, people who are part of, you know, marginalized groups do it a hell of a lot more than others. Um, I'm someone who's in a relationship with one of those people and, and I see it show up a lot. Um, how can we, as you know, facilitators of these interviews, as people who are building the cultures, like from your perspective, is this necessary for people to come and code switch and speak a certain way, as you said, or you know, how can we really normalize that it's okay to be different? Yeah. So um, these are great questions, Sarah. I think that, um, so code switching, um, a lot of people do view it as a negative, right? Because, you know, why should I have to change my conversation to speak to individuals? But I realized that we all, like you said, are multilingual, right? It's based on our background. Like, so you can speak to, you speak to your friends one way, but you speak another, another way to your team member. And then you speak another way to your CEO counterparts, right? right. And so, and that's a form of code switching. That's understanding your language, watch this, not by just the person you're speaking to, but by the level that they're in. And what I mean by that, like some people that you bring in, you have to be able to speak to them with the level of empathy that you may not have to give to your current team members based on who they are, based on what you know about them. And so I'm speaking to people based on where I'm going. If I'm being asked to come to a conference to give a presentation to women who need to be empowered to soar as HR leaders, then I'm going to use a language that's going to be able to impact them as opposed to a language that that's going to be different for my CEO. When I'm having conversations with my team here, mostly the um, gang, when I'm having conversations with them here, I'm talking regular, but there's some moments when I'm like, what happened? What you say? Word? You know, I'm using that language, right? And it's because that's how we communicate. And that's often the buy-in, right? And that commonplace that you can come together that you like, oh, okay, she understands me because she can relate to me because we have some of the same uh, language. And so I think that being able to cold switch and have a multi, be multilingual in languages is what helps bring people together. And I don't say, don't fake it right? Like if you don't have it, just don't do it, right? But being able to speak to people because you have an understanding of where they are, where they're going or who they are. And I think that it's okay to have a conversation um, at that length, in that language, at that level. And it doesn't mean the length, the, it doesn't mean the level is lower. There's no, it's, it's not lower level language. It's the level that you understand. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. And so, um, and so when I'm when I'm creating I so for my interview questions uh, for one of those companies I held I translated the interview questions because they were hiring um, they were hiring in Compton and they were hiring just people that were transitioning from prison straight into the organization and so I I changed the questions because some of the questions 
it, it wasn't relatable to them. They can't tell me about your last two jobs. They haven't had the last two jobs. They've been serving two years in prison. Tell me about a job that you had to face a challenge with and how did you overcome that challenge, right? Mm -hmm. And so now you're changing your language to, to meet that level that the individual is on. It is not about class. It's about mm -hmm. being able to communicate effectively with the person you're speaking to based on their situation. Yeah. I'm just reading all these great comments in I the know. chat about how people are interviewing. And um, I think it's, I don't know if it's Jeannie or Janae who said, people need to be aware of their bias to make these assumptions and unlearn them. And I think like that for me, when I think about code switching is more about, you know, us maybe being a little bit more open to accepting that, you know, someone may not be showing up or maybe communicating in the way exactly as we want them to, but they should not be eliminated necessarily right. because, um, right. and I think that that's just the work that's ahead of all of us until the end of time, quite frankly. Um, and again, like, I, I really hope that today, like we, one of the things that we're trying to do at Bravely is create a community where people can come together and have conversations about the hard stuff. And even if like incrementally, we can all leave conversations like this and challenge ourselves to think differently or maybe be more open in the interview that we have scheduled at some point this week. And we may not have, have done that had we not like engaged in this dialogue. Um, you know, that's the hope for conversations like this and, and having someone like you share just this incredible background and impact that you're having, Kayo. Like I, I am so grateful that you were willing to come and, and talk with me today and, and share everything that you have. Um, and I know that I absolutely, even though I was, you know, committed to this already, as I keep telling myself, the, the opportunity to grow and learn is forever. Um, and I've learned so much from you in the last couple of weeks and I hope everyone here also did today. I'm gonna put your website in the chat in the event that anyone here is doing this work, wants to engage more with you. You can connect with the two of us on LinkedIn. Um, and you can obviously connect directly with KO um, if you want to either work with her or just uh, lean on her for, for guidance. Um, but I want to turn it over to you uh, for some parting words, KO, before we end the conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed my time. I've also learned from you in these past couple of weeks. You know, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but when we first started talking, I'm a fan girl of Bravely. And so my mantra for me and building my own formula for fortitude is to be is to be brave. And so like, um, I think that what, what you're doing is helping leaders everywhere to learn how to be brave, to find the courageous part of who they are and to lead in spaces that haven't yet been created. So I wanna say thank you to you, Sarah, for what you've created here in this space and for letting me be a part of this community. I'm extremely honored. And for those of you that are here today, I hope that you realize that being the people first leader starts with you. And it starts with who you are and what you want to do and what you know that the individuals that you have been hired to serve mean. And if you begin to build the case by activating the kind code, remember knowledge inspires you, new direction, using your data to define and design new programs and systems and policies for your team, you would see impeccable impact um, in the workplace that you're working for right now. So don't stop with a no. The no is good. Swing you it. And you swing and you press even harder. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope that you guys reach out. I want to hear from you. Yes, definitely connect. Thank you, KO. Have a great week, everyone. Um, keep going in this crazy world we're living in and support each other. Bye, everyone.